All right, everybody, time for another round the world update. Uh, we always start here on my 29 miscellaneous. I always talk about how there's nothing ever going on in this tank and it just ticks over like a clock. And that still holds true, but we are finally going to talk about this tank. I actually have something to talk about with this today. Uh, I've been doing a lot of water testing. This is also going to be a bonus round the world video today because we're going to go over to my testing stations more than once and look at a few different tests today. But while running the tests, I was just testing the nitrates in a lot of my different tanks, just kind of getting an idea of what was going on, etc., etc. Uh, it's something as a fish keeper I do. You should also. And I decided I was going to test this tank. It's one of these sort of forgotten tanks. I almost don't even like to think about what the nitrates get up to in this tank because I just never do anything to it. And I say never do anything to it. And that little ding was significant. Uh, that's the test I'm waiting to finish. Um, long and short is I decided to test the nitrates in this tank and just see uh, what was going on with it. I figured it was probably about to do for water change. I cannot even remember the last time I did one. It's probably been a month, you know, and that's about what I do. I do about a 50% water change every month, maybe five weeks. I don't know. I do it when I do it, you know. Um, so I decided I was going to test the nitrates today, and they were sky high for what my tanks normally are, and I did not save that test because tests do not last. Once they're done, uh, that color will continue changing, and usually in my videos, I actually show you the vial I tested, and it always comes out looking much redder than it actually is. So today, I ran another test, and we are going to go look at it right now. So sit tight, and we're going to go over to my testing station. All right, everybody, here we are. Uh, fear not, we are not going to use all of this stuff today, but we are going to back, uh, be back here more than once looking at what we've got going on in these various files. But for now, we are going to look at this. Uh, you know how you often hear me complain that I can never tell whether it's red or orange or whatever? I am in no doubt whatsoever that we are well into the red on this one, so I don't think it's necessarily all the way up to 80 yet. Um, but we are way over 40, so I can comfortably say this tank's nitrates are at 50 parts per million. And that is significant for more than one reason, and we're going to go back over and look at the tank again while we discuss it. So we will be back here in a little while. Sit tight. All right, so other than just being a high number, why is that number so significant? That number is significant because I have shot a series of videos and I talk about nitrates and while I make it clear that nitrates are not harmless, I also make it pretty clear that for the most part, uh, the vast majority of fish out there are not hypersensitive to nitrates and if they do climb up to 40, 50, even 60 parts per million, uh, you don't have to panic. Um, I want to make it clear that that's all I'm saying. I am not in any way saying you don't need to do a water change. Believe me, I did a water change once I saw what those nitrates had gotten to. But I didn't panic. And this tank is my tank that ticks over like a clock. I have some fish in here that might be considered sensitive fish, like angelfish, um, neon tetras. I have neon tetras in here that are three years old. I've got um, zebra loaches in here or strided bodias, depending on what you want to call them. Um, I've got them in here. They're three years old. I've got these genetically modified skirt tetras, which tend to not live very long to begin with. Those are about two and a half. Um, and this tank has always been maintained and managed this way. My nitrates in this tank, pretty much every time I test it, are bright red. And I say, okay, I'll go ahead and test it. You know, or change the water, rather. Um, and I don't always test it when I change the water. I just know it's been like who knows how long since I've done a water change so I just go ahead and do one while I'm doing some other tank maintenance and I did that today I was doing a little of this a little of that I did some smaller water changes on some of my smaller tanks I have down here and so I decided since I was testing some various other things with some other water that we will get to in a minute um, I would test this one as well and then I just decided since you know I had that nice bright red vial there that was good to get on video to show everybody that I am not afraid to let my tanks get like that and as far as I'm concerned the proof is in the pudding and you're looking at it you know this tank ticks over like a machine it's beautiful there's no algae I don't have issues with you know algal blooms or anything else this tank is just beautiful and I often get nitrates that are in the bright red range like that 
So make what you want of that. Again, I'm not suggesting to do that. I'm just saying, um, you know, for these people who see that they've got 30 parts per million and half go into a panic trying to do a water change, you really don't need to panic. Do your water change, but if you can't get to it today, it can wait till the weekend or whatever. Just do it when you can get to it and don't panic. Um, these nitrates are nothing like what you need to think about if you have nitrites or worse, ammonia. If you have any ammonia at all, you need to panic and do a water change right now. I don't care if it's, you know, if it's just showing up ammonia or nitrite, you just need to do a water change. Nitrate, not so much. So we finally got to talk a little bit about this tank and now we are going to move along. Uh, one final note I will make is I have myself a nice five gallon bucket of plant food. So that is the water that came out of this tank and it is nitrate and phosphate rich. Uh, we did go to the nursery today and brought home some of our first plants for spring. So for those of you interested in my outdoors and my yard uh, type videos, you can check out those playlists because they'll be getting to uh, grow again here now that it's springtime. So moving on, we've got the Garami tank here. Um, a lot of you know from the video I did recently, but if you don't know, I will fill you in. I have actually added my shop lamp back to the top of this tank. It had gotten to the point where the algae that was in it and all of my off walks has been pretty much devoured. Uh, I've added a few fish recently, some off walks eaters. Um, a couple of rubber lip plecos and I've added a few more otosynclus. I now have 10 otos in here. Uh, two rubber lips. Somewhere in there is a Farlowella catfish, a little twig catfish. Um, so I have a fair little uh, workforce in there munching on everything. I reduced my feeding dramatically and I had reduced the lighting and the result is a tank that is virtually stripped clean of all of my beautiful algae and offlux that was growing in there. Um, so that's really all that's going on in this tank is I've cranked the lighting back up and I've stepped my feeding back up. I am going to feed them a little more uh, for a couple reasons. One, I don't want them foraging nearly as much. I want to let some stuff in there grow. And my garamis, uh, you can see my moonlight right there attacking my water sprite. Um, they're pretty much chewing up my temple plant here. You can see the serrated edges on the leaves. That is my garamis just in there destroying uh, these temple plants. So I need to pick their diet up a little bit just to get them off of my plants. And it will also allow a little bit of my algae to grow back, a little bit of my off walks to grow back. And the tank won't look quite so bright and shiny uh, like I do not like it. This looks to me like I set this tank up yesterday and I just need a little bit of age on it. I want some patina to grow back into it. And uh, so we're working the other direction now. We're actually trying to uh, dirty the tank up, so to speak, although it won't be dirty. It'll simply look a little more lived in. Uh, same things going on here with the angelfish tank. Nothing new, really. I do want to talk a little bit about the fact that I have uh, Serpe tetras in here with angelfish. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as red minor tetras, the same fish. I uh, did not know they were fin nippers when I put them in here, but they are indeed fin nippers. I've had people question like how I get away with putting them in there. Uh, I get away with it by the fact that I don't really get away with it. My angelfish uh, are always stressed out by these little guys. You can see that one right now. Um, I got a couple things going on in my favor though. I've got a lot of them in here. I think I have 15 or 16 of those little serpes. So they've got enough chasing each other around to keep themselves occupied and they really only bother the angels uh, if they drift too close or something like that. I also do my best to keep them well fed so that the nipping behavior is reduced to only sort of instinctual behavior rather than trying to feed off of the fins uh, of the angelfish because that's what they will do. They actually will eat the fins of the angelfish if they're hungry enough. So I try to keep them well fed as all my fish are uh, and that reduces the amount of actual you know feeding and it, and it just keeps it to that sort of you know the way a kitten will chase a piece of string it's not necessarily going after it because it wants to eat it it's just sort of that instinctual goes after it. Um, so but that do, does still occur uh, my angelfish do suffer for it not a lot so I don't worry about it but they do suffer for it. Uh, one of the things that you'll probably not notice but I notice um, is on my albino here. If you notice the caudal fin looks flat. Uh, he used to have two beautiful caudal filaments on there and the one on the bottom was probably a full inch long and they're simply gone now. 
this one you can see the tips are a little raggedy um, so the serpes do take their toll but you can also see I have a lot of places for the fish to hide and places for the fish to get out and get away from where the serpes are in there bothering them I usually have uh, one of my angels sits back in the corner back here and I do not see him at the moment so he's probably hiding somewhere else within the plants so that's kind of how I get away with it um, oh there he is right there it's the German blue he's the one that's usually in the back corner um, and then this one will often be out in the middle of the tank and that's why the damage occurs and then he goes up and hides in the roots again so all in all it's not too bad and uh, so you can see that behavior the leaning on the side um, that one is actually keeping its eye on the serpes that's why it swims kind of cocked to its side like that like it's listing to its side it's perfectly healthy um, it's just keeping its guard up because as you can see these serpes will come up and nip at them so lesson learned I won't do that again I don't recommend you do it um, even again in a tank like this that kind of behavior still does happen so you know not something I'd recommend doing but again it's also not anything I'm worried about angelfish or cichlids uh, so they can deal with a little bit of aggression they are a little bit aggressive themselves uh, so all in all it's no big deal so moving along we're looking at my t-bar tank now excuse me a moment <clears throat> Uh, my T-bar tank, there's not a lot going on in here other than what I was talking about with my Garami tank. I've just gone the other direction with getting this tank cleaned out. So one of the things I've been able to do was I put the lighting back on this tank. Uh, I had reduced it because I shuffled all the lights around. But I got the lighting back on this tank and I got it back on there when I put the uh, shop lamp back on the Garami tank. So we're nice and brightly lit again, and that is going to help the off walks growth. But I put two rubber lip plecos in here as well. And if this is not a prime example of what I'm talking about with my off walks being just chewed right off of the rocks, you can clearly see where they are just working it away. This morning, um, that whole sort of white bright spot on the front was not there. It was just a little bit in the back, and then this side had been worked on a little bit. So in just the last couple hours, this whole front edge and all the way down to that side has been cleaned off. Uh, you can see they've already done a good job of working on that. Uh, that white rock back there is new. Um, this little son of a gun here is a digger and he has uprooted so many plants in here including my temple plant that used to be in the back corner so I've just got the roots kind of tucked under that rock to hold it in place till I decide what I'm gonna do I keep talking about getting rid of this t-bar but I don't know he's cool I like him but I don't like him it's one of those kind of situations he does hassle my black ghost knife fish I have shot some video recently of uh, him he basically lives in this cave system under here and I tell you I've got my tripod set up and I am not kidding I've gotten hours of video of just waiting for that thing to come out and uh, so far I've gotten maybe two or three minutes of decent video I've shot one video where he came out fully um, I can attach a card or you can just check out uh, my t-bar tank playlist and that was it it's you know I haven't bothered to use any of the additional video I've gotten because it's not any better than what I've already posted it would just be the same video over again except he hasn't actually come fully out of his tank again yet or as um yeah I hope he hasn't come fully out of his tank but he hasn't come fully out of his cave uh yet since I got that one video so I haven't bothered to release anything but rest assured I am uh, waiting for him to come out and I do point my camera at that every night when I feed it and one of these days we are going to get him uh, fully out swimming around a little bit and fully exposed we're going to get a good look at that black ghost knife fish so moving on again my open top 20 boy does that look different this is one of the tanks I've been working on today as if you cannot tell so what have I done and why does that look so good the only thing I really did to it was a water change and a basic, you know, cleaning it up a little bit. Uh, I said before that the only reason it looked bad was that glass had the green spot algae all over it. And it's just tough as nails. It's really difficult to get off the glass. And I wasn't doing anything to it. I was just waiting to see if the snails that are in there would do anything, if the plecos that were in there would do anything. And they had reduced it to where it was, you know, just sort of an annoying green film to look through. But it was an annoying green film to look through. So I got in there today with my super high-tech scraper that we will look at in a minute when we get around to my brackish tank, which will be next. 
Um, I just, you know, scraped the glass there. And then I did get in and clean this up a little bit. Um, I'll try to get you a view without the light. Um, I have that green slime cyanobacteria in here. It's, eh, you know, it's in here. I don't worry about it too much. It never gets too out of control. I've been staying on top of it. Um, but I really got in there and cleaned out those plants today. They had it growing all over the leaves, so I kind of scraped all the leaves off and vacked it out. Um, that's about it. I pulled out a lot of the pothos plant that was in there. That is right here in this bucket. I don't know why that's coming out, but that is some of the water. I took two of these five-gallon buckets out of there, so I did a 10-gallon uh, water change on this tank, so that's probably, you know, 60%. Um... That was it really, you know, I scraped the glass, I pulled some stuff out and just did a basic cleaning maintenance on it. I changed the filter a couple of days ago, so I honestly didn't even bother to change the filter or anything like that. Um, so that's it. This tank is pretty heavily stocked. I know it doesn't look like it, but I've got a lot of very small fish in there. Uh, I think I've got eight or ten of those glow light tetras. I have four or five Raspora hats, and I have no less than five plecos in that tank i have four chocolate zebras and then i have one ancestral species i'm not sure what it is anymore um it doesn't really live up to the name i bought it under so i'm not really sure what it is but it's some sort of small ancestral species and that makes number five for the plecos in there uh so all told i probably have about 20 fish in this tank so it does have a fairly high stock load, but when I tested the water for this tank, and we're not going to bother to go look at it, um, I came out at about 20 parts per million on the nitrates. I was not unhappy with that at all. It's been quite a while since I've done any maintenance on this tank either. So with removing the pothos plant, I took a bunch of the slime uh, algae that was growing on that and the hair algae that was growing on that and just removed it from the tank because it was on those roots. And I have a pothos plant upstairs hanging. I'll just simply cut some more uh, pieces off of that and throw them in there. And within a week or two, I'll have more roots growing and we'll just start the process of drinking those nutrients out of there all over again. One thing I did attempt to do is this light fixture is sort of homemade. It's an under cabinet fixture. So this part of it is not actually part of the fixture. It's just two naked tubes. And I have mounted it to this. I do have a fixture that has a single tube in it. And what I tried to do today was just undo one tube and see if I could work it on one tube alone to reduce the light. And it does not work that way. If you undo one tube, they both go out. So if I get around to it and I feel like unscrewing that thing and taking it apart and remaking it with the single tube fixture that I do have, um, I might reduce the lighting on this tank to a single T5 uh, tube, but I really do like a nice brightly lit tank. So moving along, we are going to look at my poor, poor brackish tank. This tank is so bad looking right now. This is my high-tech scraper. It's a piece of wood. I cut a notch in it. I put a disposable straight-edge razor blade in it and at a little angle, and it makes for a nice scraper. Uh, that is what I used on the tank we were just looking at. So this tank looks absolutely awful, and it is absolutely awful. Um, I did some water testing on this tank as well, so let's go over once again to the testing station, and we will see what's going on with this water. All right, everybody, and here we are again. The three things I tested for in the brackish tank were phosphates, nitrates, and total dissolved solids. And then the only reason I tested for the TDS was just to get an idea of what's going on in there. Uh, I do add a lot of dissolved solids myself since it is brackish water, and I obviously, you know, mixing all those marine salts in there. So my other tanks usually sit around 250 parts per million on the total dissolved solids. My tap water comes out anywhere between 180 and 210. And my brackish tank is sitting over there at 712 parts per million total dissolved solids. But if you will notice, the phosphates are at one part per million. And the nitrates are a little over 20, maybe 30. It's not quite up to 40 yet. It's getting, you know, borderline on that red. Uh, and it is time to do a water change on that tank. But we are doing more than a water change on that tank at the moment. If you will notice this ultralife red slime treatment back here. I'm actually using that on the tank at the moment too. So we are going to go back over there and talk about that and see what's going on with that and why this is not working. 
Now, why were those numbers so significant? They were significant because they illustrate a point that I try to make to a lot of people all the time, and that is that you have to test your water to find out what the quality of it is. This tank looks absolutely awful. It really is an embarrassment. It's my one tank that I just neglected to hell, and that's what it looks like. However, I make sure the water is clean. I do not neglect my water. I test it regularly. I knew basically what we were going to find when we tested it. And it's time to do a water change. I have been treating it for the red slime bacteria, as I said, but we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, the point I was making was you have to check the water. You cannot tell by looking at a tank how clean your water is. I've said to people before, um, you know, I've asked them uh, what was going on with their water. Was everything okay? And when they would say, yeah, everything's fine, I would ask for some numbers. You know, how, what, what do your nitrites look like? What do your nitrates look like? Um, and a lot of times you'll find the answer is, oh, well, I don't have a test kit. It just everything looks okay. Um, I've heard that a lot, and you simply cannot tell. Ammonia does not look like anything. Nitrite does not look like anything. Um, nitrates, phosphates, anything can be in that water, and it can be very, very bad for your fish and look crystal sparkly clear. Uh, conversely, you can have a tank that looks like this, and the water in there is just fine. The tank just looks terrible, but it is not an unhealthy environment for the animals. It will get unhealthy if I let all of this uh, red slime continue to grow. It actually has gotten so bad in a couple of spots. If you see those nice clean rocks uh, compared to those really filthy rocks, those bubbles there got so bad under some of the smaller rocks. There's my little puffer making an appearance. That's butter bean, everybody. Uh, he is the reason I have a brackish tank. If you've never owned a puffer before, you should try it someday. Uh, they're not for everybody, but if you can pull it off, they're amazing little fish. I love my little puffer. But I neglect his tank because it's one of those tanks that's a different tank for me. I've talked before about how basically if you can't go in my water, then I don't really keep you. So this is the one tank that I have to do things to the water to make it suitable for the tank. And that's why it gets neglected. I always put this off because I didn't make a batch of water, etc., etc. Again, I do keep on top of the water so it's healthy. It just looks like crap. So I'm tired of it looking like crap. Every time I beat this stuff back, it grows back. Um, the red slime treatment that I've been using is not having any impact whatsoever. Um... It's just, I don't think it's the same species of bacteria, so that's just not going to work for me. So I'm down to the point where I'm going to be doing manual maintenance on this. I'm going to be scraping it out. I'm going to be removing those rocks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this is going to sort of be a project in its own right. So I'm not going to go into too much more detail uh, about this tank. I have recently put a hang on the back filter that allows me, to, it's got a uh, UV filter in it, UV sterilizer. Uh, so once that is cycled in, I will be removing the old filter. Uh, this is a filter for a 40 gallon tank as opposed to the 20 that I did have on there. So I think um, lack of water circulation is part of my problem uh, with the cyanobacteria in there. And I'm not sure about the lighting, etc. Again, this is going to be a project that we're going to get to uh, as time goes on. So this tank actually is my quarantine tank. And I've got 15 neons in there, and I've got three African uh, dwarf clawed frogs. I lost one of the ones we had in one of our tanks upstairs, um, so I got a few more today, and I'm going to keep them in quarantine until they grow up a little bit, and they're a little bit bigger in size. And, of course, everybody came home from the fish store today. So I always test my water that comes home from the fish store, and we are going to go back over to my testing station, and we are going to have a look at some serious tests this time. All right, everybody. We found some interesting findings today. Whenever I bring water home from the fish store, I always run it through as many tests as I can because I have no idea what's going on with their water. So, this vial is the nitrates. Now, the nitrate test, after you've shaken the vial for one minute after mixing your reagents, uh, you have to let it stand for five minutes. If you wait longer than that, that color change actually continues, so you do not get an accurate test. This has been sitting here for about ten minutes beyond the time that I actually checked it. So when I did check it, it was under 20. I was really happy to see that. I have seen it as high as about 50 or 60 parts per million coming home from the uh, local fish store before. And this is a big chain store these fish came home from. The second valve here concerns me. This is ammonia. 
and we are looking at about half a part per million ammonia, uh, which is significant. Uh, ammonia is not to be trifled with. You do not want any of that in your water, or at least you do not want detectable amounts. I'm not going to get into the fact that you're always going to have tiny amounts in there, but you don't want detectable amounts, and a half a part per million is certainly detectable. Um, so that kind of concerns me. I'm going to keep my eye on those fish. They are in quarantine, uh, so we will see uh, whether they survive or not. The next vial is the nitrites, and that looks fine at zero. Uh, we get to the general hardness. That is considerably harder than my water. Uh, this general hardness was 8 degrees, and my water is sort of odd. I actually test at zero, but because of the amount of sodium I have in there, I can sort of think about it as the equivalent of about 5 degrees hardness. So the fish are going to have to come down in hardness, and carbonate hardness is actually a little higher than my water. Water. The carbonate hardness is 4. My carbonate hardness is usually around 3. I didn't actually check my water today, but that's usually where it sits. It's pretty stable. Um, we have the pH. Low range comes in at 7.6. High range comes in at 7.4. So that's generally, you can call it 7.6 if that's the numbers you're looking at. And then when I checked the total dissolved solids, there was a measly 172 parts per million total dissolved solids. So another good uh, lesson for us is that you can have lower total dissolved solids than I have, yet have much harder water with a much higher pH. Um, so it all depends on what those dissolved solids are. My dissolved solids are sodium and nitrates and things like that that do not account for water hardness and that don't buffer pH as much as uh, calcium or magnesium would. So there's a lot to be learned by testing your water. I always like to know what my fish come home in so I know what they're going to have to adjust and how much they're going to have to adjust. So the only thing that really concerns me that we're looking at here is that ammonia test that was... Uh, a little bit of a surprise for me. I've never seen ammonia in the water uh, that the fish have come home in. So back over to the tanks and we will get this uh, video wrapped up. So two more weeks in here and then we can begin thinking about where those neons are going to go. They don't all necessarily need to go in the same place, but we will start putting those neons somewhere after a couple of weeks. Uh, we make sure everybody's okay. Uh, the frogs, and you can see one right there at the top, uh, I'm going to let them grow out a little bit, depending on what tank I wind up putting them in. I know the one uh, that I have in mind already, the frog, as long as it passes a, a quarantine period and I know is healthy, uh, will be fine. There's no more aggressive fish in there that would bother it being very small like that. So I'm not too worried about that. I'm not in any hurry to get anybody anywhere. Um, so we're just going to let this quarantine tank ride and see what happens. Again, that ammonia kind of concerns me. Those fish were under a degree of stress with that much ammonia in the water, and I don't know how long they were exposed to it. So moving on, we've got my snail tank. This is just a tank that I grow pond snails in so that I can feed my puffer butter bean. Uh, the bright white stuff you see in the back corner is simply eggshells. I have very soft water, has uh, no magnesium or calcium in it, and uh, snails and shrimp need calcium in their water for their shells. So if you've got really soft water like I do, you've got to put a, a source of calcium in there. And I find for something as simple as pond snails that aren't real fussy, uh, just some eggshells in there is plenty to dissolve into the water. Uh, when I did that, within days I noticed that their shells were starting to get a lot harder than they had been. So the eggshells work just fine for me. It's not a show tank. Uh, this tank, I don't know what it's going to wind up being. Right now, it is my gudgeon tank, and it has these two purple spotted gudgeons. I had originally thought about making it an Australian tank. Um, the gudgeons just kind of happened. I was at a local fish store one day, and they had some in. Um, I'd seen, I, I knew of them, but I'd never actually seen them before. So when I saw them, there was just no way I was coming home without them. Uh, I have had some issues with this tank since I put them in there. I had three of these originally, and one died about two weeks after getting them, maybe three weeks after getting them. I'm not really sure what was going on or why it died. I was having a little bit of issues with the cycle. It wasn't fully finished when I put the fish in there, so I was keeping on top of that. Uh, the ammonia was fine. I was just still dealing with a little bit of nitrites building up, and I never let it get over half a part per million. These two fish didn't suffer at all, uh, but one of them very suddenly one day was just, you know, looked awful and was pretty much on its way out the door, so I euthanized it. 
I also put two banjo catfish in here that looked just fine uh, for several days, maybe even 10 days, and then one died, and then about four days later, the other banjo died as well. And the way they died was, to me, uh, indicative of when the water hardness is not correct. And I've said, you know, already in this video, I have very soft water. But because of the sodium ions, it's just a little odd and a little tricky. So once fish adjust to my water, they're okay in it. And I have a feeling that's what happened with the banjos, is they're a very adaptable fish and they're very hardy, but they have to adjust to your water. And in that case, I actually did not test the water they came home in. So I really don't know what I took them out of and what I put them in. And that's my fault for not testing it. And there's no way I can test it now uh, because that moment in time was gone. Even if I go back to that store and get a sample of their water, um, it would have had to have been that water that day because it's different now. So I really don't know what it was, but I suspect that I put them in water that they were not fit to be in. So we're left with these two gudgeons. Now these two gudgeons have already spawned twice since being in this tank. Uh, that very well could be the cause of death of the third gudgeon uh, because they were all in the tank when these two spawned the first time and they were really aggressive about it. So I'm not sure, uh, again, you know, what was going on there. But I'm down to these two as a mated pair. They spawned again the other day. If you look here in this corner, you can kind of see some gunk left on the glass. That is sort of like the glue that they stick their eggs to the glass with. All of the eggs are actually gone. But the first batch didn't last overnight. Uh, this batch actually lasted into the third day before the last one was finally gone. Um, so they did get better about it. And I think what I might do is put a piece of glass or slate or something in there and hope that they lay their eggs on that. And once the eggs are, you know, there, I can just go ahead and pull that out of the tank, put it into another tank with plenty of aeration and filtration, and hatch a brood of these gudgeons. I think that would be awesome. So that's kind of what I'm doing with this tank at the moment. We're going to just sort of let it sit the way it is and see if it doesn't just become my sort of show slash breeder tank that has some gudgeons in it. Maybe I'll get a, a nice fancy pleco on the bottom or something like that and we'll call it good and this will be that tank. Uh, one last note on this tank, you will see that I've got some of that brown diatom algae forming on the back. I think that's a good sign. Uh, that's usually the last part of a new tank coming in, uh, you know, sort of into its own and balancing out is you'll start getting a lot of that uh, brown diatom algae for a little while and eventually that'll just sort of go away on its own. Um, but the fact that it's growing in back there lets me know that I'm well through the cycle, everything's fine, and we're now getting into that last sort of, uh, you know, finding its balance, the silicates are coming out of the water, etc. So moving on to the final but certainly not least tank is my 125. I've really not got anything going on here specifically other than the big water change I did the other day. I did a video about it um, in its own right, so there's no need to go into a big discussion about that. Um, the Congos have been spawning again, so those are always just fun to watch. Um, Again, not really anything to discuss other than uh, I did a big water change. I trimmed the plants back some. I am still considering getting some sort of um, algae-eating fish other than the Otocinclus. I'm talking about maybe putting some sort of Pleco in there uh, or something that is a little more uh, substantial than the Otocinclus, something that's going to be a little more showy, a little more interesting when we see it. But I really do think of this as my African tank. It is very African themed. I know not every fish in there is an African fish, but the majority of them are. And I just think that a Pleco in there would just look so out of place. Uh, my angelfish tank has a Cynodontis in it and while they are capable of living in the same water because of my water it just looks really out of place to me when I see a Bolivian ram and tetras and angelfish and then there's an African Cynodontis swimming around amongst them. Um, I've toyed with the idea of trying to get the Cynodontis out of there and put it in this tank. Uh, if I ever, ever do happen to catch it, it is going to come out and go in this tank um, but I'm not going to make that effort just for that. I'm going to leave him where he is for now. So again, don't really know, I'm just sort of speculating, kind of thinking out loud while we have a look at the tank, because this tank's always nice to look at. I really like this one a lot. Those Congo Tetras are just fantastic. They spawn constantly, 
and they are just absolutely gorgeous when they do it the males just light up their colors are fantastic they just pop like crazy uh, they compete they show off they chase each other around um, and they do this probably three times a week so if you've got a tank that's a little larger you got a little bit of running around room you know maybe a 30 long would be the smallest I would consider and even that's probably a little on the small side these guys get pretty big um, they are schooling fish like all tetras so you do need to put a small group of them in there I actually have 11 of them in this tank but this is a 125 gallon tank um, so if you had a 40 or something you could have a school of five um, and again they're congos I mean they're tetras so they're not super aggressive they're not going to be um, too much of a problem if you put them in a community tank so there you have it I'm gonna call that the end of this video that was your around the world we get back here to the beginning and we are at my 29 miscellaneous that just had its lovely lovely water change and is looking all beautiful and sparkly so on one final note, I will say that during the evening, if you see that blinking light up there, that is my CO2 counter, and it is blinking at 1,000 parts per million. When I was a little more active down here earlier and was walking around and working, uh, we had the CO2 down here up to 1,200 parts per million. So again, just something I'm keeping my eye on. I am going to do a little more specific videos about how that correlates to my tank, uh, etc. I just like to point out that I am sort of monitoring the CO2 levels down here for future reference. So if you're not already subscribed, please go ahead and do so. Hope you enjoyed this very long-winded video. Uh, you got the whole tour all the way around, lots of stuff going on, so you don't want to miss any of it. So thanks for watching, and I will see you real soon on the next one.